And you keep them coming in. You're doing well, son. Find us on the web at mbradio.us. I want to make it clear that the views expressed by our hosts are not considered the official stance of MBR views. Remember, this is all about having fun and enjoying the ride. Welcome to God. I'm a bisexual, open woman that served in the military. Brownwater Navy, shout out to my Airedales. One in three veterans experience military sexual trauma. Here we use whiskey for good and talk about all different events that affect veterans and how we can do better to make sure that no one has to release their burden of rape at these gates anymore and ensure that veterans' lives are advocated and lived for. Hey! So, special thank you to Military Broadcast Radio for ensuring my fellow Amazonians that were raped or sexually assaulted in the military have a chance. Again, we have a 1 um, and 50-50 chance of killing ourselves after being sexually assaulted raped or harassed in the military and then we are at an 80 percent risk after that one event of getting into domestic violence so this is an epidemic that is hitting the military that affects over 30,000 personnel every single year and so today i have the great distinct honor of having a fellow uh, navy veteran on her name is jenna carlton the manelian veteran so um just uh Kind of very excited that you're here and maybe introduce yourself for um, for the crowd here. Yes, I am so pumped to be here. Thank you. We had Audrey on Vet Chats, wow, probably like a, a year and a half ago. It's, it was a while ago, but we we just instantly connected. So I'm, I'm happy to be here. Um, my name is Jenna and I, I was in the Navy. I did weather. Um, I was in from 2013 to 2017, and when I got out, I wanted to pursue veterans uh, politics. So I did an internship up in D.C. at the House Committee on Veterans Affairs, and it, I decided it was not the way I wanted to go about helping veterans. Um, so I started my community called the Millennial Veterans, and uh, we have a Facebook group. I have a podcast, and I recently published a workbook, which I'm sure we'll get into all of those throughout the chat. Yes, yes. So I'm just going to throw it up here so you guys can see this beautiful uh the millennial veterans uh so that's our her facebook chat so you can check it out there and then uh here's jenna's beautiful uh dress whites uh, if you guys have not been in the Navy, that is one of the hardest uniforms to keep clean period i mean it's iconic it's beautiful i wouldn't trade it for another uniform ever but it is um it's it's hard to keep clean so just wanted to make sure that you guys recognize her greatness there as a petty officer <laughs> i love that and and that was taken during fleet week so we were in new york city and it was super hard to keep it clean walking around there <laughs> i mean like i just if there were like there were one aspect of they're like do you you know you i always had like when i went to an amphibious unit i got to wear camis so it was like so and this was before we were in green cami so this was before these you know the blue uniform came out I, that came yeah. the year i was getting out right so i was just like yes sign me up for ironing sleeves any day of the week over having to to wear that because um i loved it but it was so hard to keep clean um so hard so at the gunslingers tavern we're usually slinging some drinks and um so you know I won't have you drink bourbon um, this early in the morning. But um, so do you have a favorite song that when you joined the military, you really liked? Yes. Do you have a favorite song now? And do you have a favorite pour, favorite pour whiskey? Oh, oh, I love these questions. Um, so the first the first song that came to mind was Part of Me by Katy Perry. Um, that was super popular when I joined and it was like the whole music video was her joining the Marines. She got in a breakup and she cut off her hair and then she becomes this badass woman. And it was so inspiring for me to see that before I went to boot camp. So yes. That's awesome. <laughs> yes. Um and a song that I like now. Uh mm -hmm. ugh, that cha it changes every day, but um 
Oh, that's hard. Something that I, I love to listen to while I'm working is um, I can't go for that with um, uh, it's CeeLo Green does it with um, oh, what's what's we his won't name? put you on the spot. We got the name. It's good. Yeah, I can't go for that. Look it up. They do like a jam session on YouTube with CeeLo Green. I can't believe I can't think of his name, but it is awesome. <laughs> It's okay. It's okay. We we all have veteran brain fog after a while. Oh, yes. it's, it's all cool. It's part of it. So, um, and do you have a favorite pour? I'm like literally known for you know just straight chugging. Mm. <laughs> yeah. I love that. Um, gosh, I'm not really a whiskey girl. I don't mm. know. Is that for you? Yeah, I, you're gonna have to put me onto it because I I can't even name any good whiskeys. Um, I got my husband some Angel Bourbon, Angel's Envy. Angel's Envy. Yeah. Yes, that one. Um, and I tried that. That was pretty good. Mm -hmm. That's good. Yeah, I'm a brand ambassador for um two um uh, veteran owned uh, whiskeys. One is actually locally in D.C., so that's uh, Mount Pleasant mm -hmm. Whiskey Club. We just dumped um, five barrels yesterday, and so by the end of the week, it'll be proofed down. So it's actually something that um, it's a veteran and a fellow Penn Stater. Boop, boop. Um, they've collaborated. He found a bottle, an empty bottle in his uh, his ceiling tile, and then actually started to make that pre-prohibition whiskey. And so uh, we get to use whiskey for good in my nonprofit and host uh, like whiskey tasting events. And then I'm a brand ambassador for Brass and Anchor, which is owned by three. Uh, two of them are now retired maybe and then the other one is still on active duty he's a, a command master chief so it's um it's it's pretty cool um so that's yeah. why you know and then whiskey's just in my my bloodline so I, it's just uh it's just a, a thing it's ours um bourbon is um we were made the bourbon was made by the military and uh, we were rolling around with the revolution uh it was ours so it's uh it's something that i i bring up because you know you never know. Um, so for me, like, uh, I remember training to Godsmack, um, you know, <laughs> Navy commercial. I mean, I knew I was going to join the Navy in second grade. Um, and I come from a long line of uh, military. So what, what made you join the Navy? And when did you join the Navy? After talking with my uncle, um, who was in the Navy, you know, he just told me about the experience he had, and you know, he really got to see a lot of the world. Um, and then I'm from the smallest town ever. So I was like, I want to see the world. I want to get out of here. I want to get out of Wisconsin. So I thought that would be the way. And I joined right out of high school um, in 2013. Yep. Oh, wow. So how long were you in for? I did four years and I was, I was ready to go. Right, that's your commitment level. Um, you know, that you finished your contract. So nothing wrong with four and the door. Mm -hmm. Thanks, kid. Um, so what was your experience like in the military that was um, positive for you? And then we'll kind of get into some of the negativity that obviously is existing in the military culture today. Yeah, I, I feel like it taught me a lot. Um, I, I always thought I was an independent person uh, because I was the only child. And then it, it taught me, you know, a little more discipline that I needed and how to have structure in your life, how to be dedicated to something besides right. yourself. And, um, you know, I, I love, I met the coolest people from all over the country and all over the world, really. Um, so those were some of my biggest takeaways was just finding out and meeting people from different cultures and backgrounds and, and ways of life. I loved learning about other people's upbringings. Yeah, I would say the, the military is like that, that true family that no matter what, like as soon as you find out that they're military or um, that they're in need, like you automatically will be willing to help them or just you're, you have a connection that it's just different. Like it's, it really is a brotherhood and sisterhood that crosses generations. Um, there's, there's no other way to explain that bond other than you have to go join the military to get it. <laughs> like, I just don't, I don't know it anyway. So, all right. 
so I have, um, you know, I was raped in the military over 10 times. I was sexually assaulted multiple times. I was sexually harassed by my chain of command. I actually got retaliated against. I lost uh, jobs in the Hilo. Um, I, you know, almost was murdered um, in the military after being raped um, multiple times. And, you know, I reported um, my sexual assault. I reported that that rape and uh, nothing was done. Um, for one incident, the guy got a suspended sentence, like as in a sentence of, you don't get to be an E3 for six months, right? And so I appealed that and I said I wanted an admiral's mask and that never happened. Um, so I wonder, you know, did you experience military sexual trauma? Did you experience any rape or harassment um, or sexual assaults in the military? And if it happened to you, um, were you like me just witnessing it everywhere? I was experiencing this myself and seeing this in my chain of commands at the command I was stationed at. And then my friends that were stationed on the Eisenhower, I was watching them get raped by chiefs. And, you know, like I had a friend that went AWOL because he was literally stationed at fleet and family with her and he would be harassing her every time that he saw her. And so it, it would just be like, I'm reporting this, but now, you know, I've almost been murdered and I'm seeing it happen everywhere and I'm seeing it happen to males. I'm seeing I'm under I'm serving under don't ask, don't tell. So, you know, when my, you know, uh, officer finds out that I'm bisexual, he's demanding that I sleep with him and his wife. And when I say no, he took away my ability to fly in that helo. So he took my mission away. Um, so I saw a lot of retaliation. So just kind of wondering what your experience was in in the military for that. Yeah, like like yourself, it it was everywhere, and it started right in, at A school. As soon as I checked in, there was a captain's mast for uh, an air an airman. She was an airman who was raped. At, on the base, you know, and everyone was saying, oh, she just woke up with dick remorse. That's not what happened. And that's the narrative. And, you yeah. know, I was so naive and, and, you know, I didn't understand it. So even a part of me believed, oh, maybe she was just drunk because I didn't know any better at mm -hmm. the time, even though in high school that had already, I'd already been sexually assaulted. I think a lot of us who were are in denial and then, you know, we want to believe like, oh, it was, it was it's almost easier to believe it was my fault for putting myself in that situation than to believe that someone is that cruel um but anyhow that yeah that's that's so complex but yeah that kind of set the tone for the rest of my my time serving you know it was a lot of comments um we're wearing camis right at, and you wouldn't believe the amount of times i've been looking up and down and just felt like a piece of me and then I was on a carrier. I didn't even want to go in the gym. I wouldn't go in the gym unless it was really early morning or no one was in there and I was on night shift because I was just like, I hated being looked at like that. I still today, I, I'm like conscious about wearing tight things and who I'm around. Um, but yeah, I had my first, um, I was sexually assaulted in my A school and um I didn't want to report that person because they were my friend and you know, they were, they were really apologetic about it. And I also had a boyfriend at the time. So I didn't want to share my story because I didn't want, you know, everyone to know what happened. There, there's so many reasons why people don't want to report. And, and yeah, I was, I was just like, okay, he was truly sorry. It was a one-time thing. And then years later, my friend calls me and she tells me that she was raped by him. So um, it, it's almost like I, I've carried this guilt and about not reporting. That's not your fault, right? Like um, the fact that you didn't want to report is it, that that's your choice, right? And so then he made a conscious decision to continue that perpetration of crimes. So I would just encourage you not to hold that trauma space you know and and i say that we don't hold trauma we hold memories of crimes that were perpetrated against us and so kind of like when we go into that space and kind of realize that 
no, like this is a crime that was committed against me. I don't have trauma. I have a memory of somebody being a complete and total fucking piece of shit in this world. Mm -hmm. And so um, that's just my, my only um, caution and advice to you. And I, you know, I can understand and, and relate, right? Like they always want us to carry what they did to us and to silence us and to shame us into one not reporting or one thinking that it's our fault or having the clothing we were wearing or drinking as to to as for us to acknowledge what their crimes are and so um that's the only that's the only thing i could say and and it's definitely not your fault and even if you would have reported it at the same time we're, we're serving uh the chances are he nothing would have happened <laughs> like yeah 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 you're, you're so right i i've been, i've been working on that and that i really mm -hmm. appreciate you saying that um because just hearing it out loud it really it really helps um mm -hmm. trying to let go of that and and i love the way you looked at that because really it is a memory of a crime that was committed against me and right. i think that's very powerful to say it's a crime because that that's what should hold that person accountable um so, so yeah, yeah, I'm, I work, I'm working through that. Um, and then there's, there's like, um, a few other things that happened to me that I'm just not ready to talk about. Um, you know, I've recently just kind of accepted that they, they were crimes against me, you know, they, that they were sexual abuse because sometimes we just make excuses for people, um, and you know it, it takes time i think it takes a lot of time for survivors to come out and really understand what has happened to them yeah i mean i would say that as warriors as we continue in this journey of healing right um i was raped over 10 times from 2004 to 2005 and then got into you know a horrific abusive marriage which when we're 80 percent likely to have that happen it happens right after there was no time you know i felt worthless i felt like nobody's gonna want me i've been raped this much and then i get into an abusive relationship like literally the day after i get married i get punched in the face and I'm on active duty. And again, I'm talking about what's happening to me and I'm pregnant and nobody's helping, right? And so like a lot of us get into narcissistic abusive relationships right after this trauma and there's really no help in any of the military to kind of address this. But the, the what they try to do is make sure that we absorb all of the pain. And it's taken me over 20 years to be able to speak publicly about it to share my story um and i can go into graphic detail right and that's still something that a lot of people are too triggered to do and mm -hmm. i think that everybody is healing in their own way but i also feel like for me like they try to label what happened to us to make themselves feel better or even society feel better so mm -hmm. i feel like when we're when we're raped or sexually assaulted, and I was sexually assaulted in A school too, and sexually harassed, you know, by my recruiter before even getting in. And then as a Jew, faced racial discrimination. I was not expecting any of these things in the military. And then, you know, I'm bisexual and now I'm facing that as well. So it was just like, what what the fuck did I just step into? All I'm trying to do is serve my country. Is they tell us that we're victims. And then they label it next as well, you're a survivor, right? And so, and then you get to be a warrior. And so for me, it's like, no, you get to be an Amazonian. You get to heal in your own right and you get to put the words to your pain. Nobody else gets to. And I really feel like um, being able to call them crimes, being able to call them perpetrators is very significant because we have people that work in the federal government that were military or are still in the military that are promoted and they're rapists and they continue to con have this good old boys club where they're protecting these rapists and we the people that have had these crimes committed usually get out right we we have no more desire 
to stay in the military. Um, I was supposed to be in for 20 years, right? And so this definitely impacted my whole rest of my adult life. Like it joined when I was 19. Um, and it's taken me 20 years to say, I was raped over 10 times, right? Uh, these guys committed these crimes and some of them I can put names to, but it was the, the when I reported it at medical, I, I had a date rape drug and um, I escaped this guy. He was a civilian. My friend brought me over. She was not my friend, clearly. Um, he tried to sexually assault me and rape me in this room. I was able to get him off of me and get away, right? So I called these Marines that I had over my house numerous times and said, I'm super drunk. I'm in Little Creek right now, or I'm, I'm not drunk. Like somebody gave me a date rape drug and I'm terrified and I just need your help. And then they date raped me. Like I went to them, they put me on their shoulders, put me on the couch. Right. And I'm like, I just need to relax right now and go to sleep. And then they were like, no, we want to take your clothes off and help you take a shower. Right. And then they raped me. So um, it's like, even when you go for help, they don't help you. So I went to medical and I literally was like pregnant and didn't know. So I got an STD check. They gave me gonorrhea medication. And then within days I started bleeding and I had a miscarriage. Oh my goodness. Right? So at medical, the corpsman asked me for his name. And I just wanna say that they are mandate reporters. I gave them mm -hmm. the command. I gave them the information and no one no one contacted me. Like if you're supposed to be a mandated reporter at that time, you want to tell me why there was an investigation opened up? Yeah. And I mean, to... I, I was scared, right? But yeah. what more can you do when you're going to the medical place asking for help? And then you have a confirmation like, oh yeah, yeah, I'm pregnant and now I just miscarried. It was a horrible thing to have to, to have to carry around. And, you know, now I can hear their conversations. So I was in and out of it, right? Like mm -hmm. so much so that they dragged my body and placed me on a bed to sodomize me, right? The other guy. But the only guy that penetrated me unprotected was somebody that I super liked. And so then they were like, well, you have to get her to sleep with you again, because if she reports it, it'll make her look like a platoon whore. Wow. So they like literally plotted, planned, knew that I was coming them for help and did nothing to help me other than rape me. And um, I think, you know, when you carry that around, like, gee, would I have gotten an abortion if I had known? Or, you know, like I just tried to get an STD check and make sure that I was safe and I miscarried a baby, right? Mm -hmm. and so I had to carry that deep, like hole in my heart around because somebody decided to do that to me that I asked for help from. And mm -hmm. this was a person I like really like liked, super, super liked. And he did this intentionally. And so having to resolve all of that and being like, well, you know what? It's not my fault. It, none of this is my fault. I'm mm -hmm. not holding on to this anymore because it's affected me for over 20 years and they've moved on with their lives, right? Like one of them is a therapist, which is just like, you know, you're like, how could you be a therapist and have children and have daughters? Like, I hope that what you did to me never happens to them. Never, never happens to them. But, you know, that's what we're kind of dealing with. We're kind of dealing with them being able to cover up their crimes, even when you're doing the right things to report them. And then them carrying on with their life and us mm -hmm. holding these times with us. And um, that's what I want to encourage mostly for people to, to start healing and kind of remembering mm -hmm. like, this is never your fault. It's never going to be your fault. And this shame is not ours to carry. In fact, you know, I could start naming their names and ruining their lives, right? But mm -hmm. I'd really focus on people that are way higher up <laughs> than, um, than these guys, because if uh, if I'm able to affect the system of politicians and you know um, people in the military that are high up, 
I'm able to start ending the cycle of this and changing the culture, which is much more important than than going after just these people. But I do want people to know that you can report at any time, um, mm -hmm. even years later you can still file a police report you can still call ncis and yes it's been a long time and it's going to make your investigation harder but if you do want to report that avenue is there and i didn't even find that out until almost a year ago which is you know why aren't these things being spoken about yeah yeah that's so true um and it and I think it's important for people to know that your the, your um, perpetrators or the people that are assaulting and raping, they're your friends. They're mm -hmm. usually people you trust or even leaders that have built a connection with you uh, and, you know, came off really supportive and helpful and and then as soon as they can, they'll cross that line or they'll they'll put you in a situation where you're a little more vulnerable and, and that's the sick part that yeah because yeah they're grooming you mm -hmm. they're, they're grooming you so you know um if they're if it's not a friendship thing and it, it's a superior officer or even a superior enlisted person they're grooming you and they're putting you in a place of weakness intentionally because their whole goal is to do this to you there, there's nothing nice about them. They're they're not trying to help further your career. They're grooming you so that they can either sexually assault you or rape you and then put you in the position where you can't report because he, on paper, he's such a great guy. He, he helps make these study halls to advance people so that they can get promoted for petty officers, right? Mm -hmm. So they'll have this persona of, you know, they're fucking sailors of the years, but really they're rapists. They're rapists. Yeah. And so this mm -hmm. is the culture that we're we're up against. And so I just want to say, Jenna, that like as your fellow like warrior sister, as your Amazonian, I'm really proud of you. Um, one, I think it's amazing that you've written a book. I think it's amazing that you have vet chats. I think it's amazing that you're willing to share your story. Um, even the parts that you're not willing to share right now. It's still an amazing part in your journey because mm -hmm. you have chosen to not be silenced. And I think that breaking the barrier of silence and not holding the trauma, and even if it's just in your own mind, holding them accountable for the crimes that they've committed against you is, um, it's inspiring, right? It, it's inspirational. So I just wanna say thank you for, for that part of sharing that part because people act like this is a a women only issue and it's really one in three in the military and it has no sex it has no gender it has no religion these are just perpetrators targeting people and allowing crimes to be committed in the military against your own which is the worst kind of feeling because you join the military because you want this sense of brotherhood and sisterhood. And so it's such just a, it's institutional violation, right? It, it's the mm -hmm. worst kind of, of violation. And then when you reach out for help, you have a chance of being murdered. And with civilians, with that happening to them on the outside, one, their cases are prosecuted extremely higher than what we ever see. Um, and two they don't usually have a chance of being murdered when they're reporting um and so that's like it's such a big thing so i just want to say thank you for sharing um that story and i really appreciate your courage and i want people to hear to hear what it's going on um you know i have male veterans that are from the korean war veteran um era now and they're just now saying I can file a claim. And so, yes, this happens in combat, but it happens anywhere. It happens anywhere a perpetrator is allowed to, to thrive. And usually they're in some kind of place of power and they're going to just keep doing it because even when people know that they're doing it, they just don't stop it. They don't stop mm -hmm. it. So, mm -hmm. yeah. so we'll transition into a, 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 better, a better topic. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to put on the screen um, your book. 
so the viewers can see it. It's called the Veteran Workbook. And um, so kind of just, I'm um, going to take it off so that we can see your beautiful face. And, um, and so kind of tell us uh, what made you write your book? And then I want you to kind of explain your four areas that um, that, you know, you've gone over about that veterans kind of really have these four areas that really kind of need to be honed into. Yeah. Yeah. So I've I've always been big into journaling and writing things down and, you know, getting getting all those thoughts out. So I wanted to bring that concept to the veteran world. Um, and so th this book, it's it's a lot of questions with different themes, a lot of prompts to help veterans write their own story and really process what they have just gone through. Um, because when we get out, we're always like, what's next? What are, what's your career going to be like? How are you going to provide for your family? Um, it's never what just happened to you. So I wanted a tool for veterans to use to process that. And, and that's, um, so there's four, four points that each um, each section falls under. So the first one is reflection, reflecting on your service. The second one is recreating structure without the military because you know we had that set of structures, everything was so rigid, we're here and here, and then we get out and it's like freedom. So how do you, <laughs> how do you build that back up in your life that's going to kind of cater to your goals and what you wanna do with your next chapter? Um, the next one is, uh, oh gosh, it is um, reflection of service, recreating structure, finding yourself. So not finding yourself because you're already here, but recreating yourself um, mm -hmm. because so much of our identity was tied up with the military, what we were wearing, um, what we were doing, how we were even talking. So it's really just kind of reassessing what, um, what what you want out of who you want to be in this next chapter of your life and the last one is planning for your future because in the military you had deployments you had orders you didn't really have control over your future where you were living where you were working so this is um these questions in this um those themes kind of help you uh figure out what kind of plans you want to make right which is super exciting. I'm, I'm grateful that you kind of put it there because, you know, people really like for me after all of this, it's, it's been very hard to write um, some of this stuff, especially with a traumatic brain injury. Um, so it's, it's kind of beautiful to see that you've laid it out so easily for, for a veteran to kind of really explore their new life path right that's what i feel like it is it's one it's, yeah. it's resolution with your military service and it's kind of like getting deeper into yourself and saying okay like i'm always going to be military i always have that this is always going to be my military family but i'm not in anymore and so if i'm not you know running a nonprofit for for veterans if i'm not hosting you know an instagram vet chat show you know what am i going to do beyond this and I think when people transition out of the military, you know, you get this TAPS week when I was in and it's just, it's not enough to kind of, it would be awesome if your book was there, like at every um, TAPS place. Like, yeah, maybe, so, maybe someday. Yeah, like a workshop or something, that'd be great. But you know, it's something so, so needed for veterans because we're like lost when we get out. Like our identity is, like you said, it's so tied into that. We're, we're used to PT, we're used to um, all of these things. So it's, it's, I think it's wonderful. Like, I think it, it is such a needed area for people to expand into. So how can we get your book? So the book is on Amazon um, and it's not searchable yet because it is pretty new. So if you go to my Instagram bio, you can find the link there um, at the Millennial Veteran and it's $10. I made it as cheap as I could because my goal is to just get it out there. I want every, every veteran to try it out. And it doesn't matter how long you've been out or what area you served. These, these questions are pretty, pretty broad so anyone can relate to them. That's awesome. Yeah. So check out our IG, one ill veteran. Um, it's a little icon. So we'll make sure that we, we post it down and thing. Um, so the next thing is, you know, you wrote a book. Um, you know, you you kind of transitioned out of the military, you've been healing, and then you kind of host this pretty dope 
place called Nut Shacks. Um, <laughs> there we go. And um, so let's fill the viewers in kind of what that's about. And um, I've been on it and I, you know, I feel like that you're an empowering um, woman, an empowering sailor, and you kind of just, um, the people that you bring on have like it's it's such a good connection um i would highly encourage people to go to your show and you know you have a live stream so let's let's hear more about it yeah so it it started um through the facebook group there was just so many people getting out and doing cool stuff and i was like i want to i want to showcase it definitely because we don't hear a lot about what younger veterans are doing so i wanted I wanted to dedicate a space to them to see how they're continuing their service and how this generation, you know, we care about veterans issues. We want to make the veteran community a better place, a more diverse place that's welcoming to all veterans of different backgrounds, not just those who have been accepted at every American Legion and every VFW. We, we want... We want to amplify the voices of those who are different and and don't feel accepted in the veteran community so others will and and that's what we do and we're on instagram every sunday at 9 p.m eastern time um we're chatting and we always welcome questions uh, and, and the live is a lot of fun because you get commenters and yeah it, it's a good time it is. I've, um, I've, you know, I've been on your show, but then I've also uh, watched, and I think that every person that you have on there kind of makes an impact um, on our veteran community. And right now, we are the largest um, veteran population, um, and so we are, you know, we are really the ones that are going to advocate and make change. And um, you know technically you know mst we have the highest rate of suicides so it's like just having a show like yours is gonna allow people to see that we're still here and you know maybe reach out for help or maybe say wow you know i didn't even know that thing existed and now i have another outlet to heal so um i'm very appreciative that that you have that and so how would you say starting um vet chats improved your wellness like how did it help with your ptsd how did it help you heal and um obviously i know you're making an impact for the lives of others but how has it helped you it's helped me realize so much even just by um talking with guests i've i've heard their stories and it's inspired me to come forward and share my story um like when you came on and we're just so honest and so vulnerable it was it was just so inspiring to me and i even got messages after that where people were like wow just what you got guys were talking about you know that just makes me feel less alone so it, mm -hmm. it's it's so important and that's it, it's helped me get out of my own head and focus on others and realize i'm not alone um there's so many of us that go through this and and there's hope and there's another side so yeah it, it's been a huge part of my healing journey that's awesome. There is another side, right? Like, um, I use board sport therapy, right? So, you know, I take people that have these stuck points. That's what I call them. Cognitive based therapy, um, board sports. And so we use things like shame or guilt and, you know, we talk about it for about 20 minutes and then we go on a board. And because a lot of us, um, detach, right? We detach from this pain and we're really, really good at it because this is how we survived. But when you get on a board, you have to have situational awareness. So you you come into your body and a lot of us just don't stay in our present moment. Like we're always in the past or we're thinking about, you know, this horribleness that can happen in the future. And so it's a way for veterans that can actually stay in, um, in our present moment. And so that is very healing for me. Like um, even when I have people contact me that have just been raped in the military and that's extremely hard to hear somebody at 19 having that happen to them when it happened to me at 19 and that it's still happening and like you know the numbers are too high and um i'm like this is insane or somebody's been murdered because of it and then you don't hear anything about it on the news and you're like this is this cannot continue in this manner but to hear other people heal right like writing for you is obviously very therapeutic um there's art therapy there's i do woodworking um 
so, you know, there's singing for guitar for vets, right? There's so many different outlets for us to be able to heal. And I think that it's good to explore it, right? Because when we have triggers, just because one of the toolbox things didn't work doesn't mean that your toolbox has to stay empty. I call it like having an ammo canister, right? And so you just got to keep filling it up to find the things that actually work for you. And I think that the more we talk about our mental health, uh, the more that we bring awareness, the more that we're just honest with each other, because I think, you know, for someone to say, yes, I have suicidal ideation. I do. Right. Like that is part of PTSD because I had horrendous <laughs> crimes committed against me. But that's no different than my brother and sister who is experiencing combat PTSD because they're experiencing that same level of like, I don't want to fucking be here. Same thing. So like how we unify with each other and keep going forward so that we can beat PTSD together, I think it's so, so important. And using our platforms, one, it's healing. Um, I don't really get bothered at all about talking about what happened to me now because I've kind of released all of that. It took a long time. It took like an intensive um, IOP, six months and two weeks. Uh, it took a lot of exposure therapy. I did that myself. Um, and then I got a therapist, right, that helped me deal with narcissistic abuse and then just like constant, you know, uh, I guess EDMR. And I think that it's really, really important just because um, exposure therapy, what I did, I went back to all the locations except for a few where this happened to me. Most people would not dive in like that, right? But for me, I was like, I've opened this up and I'm going full in, right? Like, because the sooner I get better, the sooner I can start helping other people on their healing journey, right? And so um, not everybody can do that, but I'm able to now be healed and say, hey, <laughs> I still struggle with these triggers. Here's how I do it. And that doesn't mean that this is going to be the way that you heal, but here's an example. And there's literally 250 other ways off of this sheet that kind of can help you get back into re-regulating your system with your nervous system after you've had a trigger like there's so many different paths and if i can't help you i'm sure there's a veteran out there that can be your battle that can help you and so i kind of feel like you have the platform for that like that people are encouraged and you know there's a lot of great shows and there's a lot of us out here advocating and trying to make an impact um, because our generation is going to be the generation that helps change it I firmly believe it. Mm -hmm. Like our generation of service, we're going to be the ones that stand up to this and say, we're going to change the military to what the honor of the military is supposed to be. Because mm -hmm. you can't conduct yourself with honor, courage, and commitment and be a perpetrator like that. And so we have to get these people out of our military because you look at 30,000, 30,000 personnel a year. And we're talking about people that are highly specialized in language, people that are flying, people that work in cybersecurity, and we're killing our military from within. Like mm -hmm. literally. And then on top of it, we have 80% of a service member chance being in domestic violence. And we're spent, you know, we're putting that onto their children to their family members. And so where we used to have this long lineage of military service. There are people saying, I don't want my kids to join the military anymore because it's not safe. Mm -hmm. um, and so for me, I want to be able to say, yes, you have a one in three chance of, of being raped in the military, sexually assaulted or harassed. But I wake up every day trying to make it a better place for you. And I still want you to serve your country. And um, but I want that number to be told to them. I want them to have a real analysis because people have said if you knew you were going to be raped in the military would you join again my answer is yes right because why should i've changed my path because of what a criminal did mm -hmm. right right why 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 would i not join the military like of course i wanted to serve my country that asshole didn't <laughs> he wanted to be a criminal um so i think that you know we just have to keep using our voice and so it's definitely improved, improved your mental health. You're, you're making a difference out here. Um, I'm really proud of you. 
So, you know, in the, in the Navy, we have an easy day, right? It's an easy day, right? Um, <laughs> Navy is like, how you doing? Oh, it's a fine, easy Navy day, right? So Navy day, mm -hmm. easy, easy day. All you got to do is, is do this and it's going to be an easy day. So do you have a favorite easy day memory from the Navy? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Let's see. So there was a lot of... Um like what do they call them steel beach picnics where yes. you go up on the flight deck and yeah i have like a, a fun memory i think it was the fourth of july we were out there and you know it was just towards the end of deployment and everyone was just in a great mood we're on our way home everyone's a little goofy and every a lot of like regulations are more relaxed and we're just eating some burgers they didn't taste that good but it, it was just it was just sorry fun. cs's sorry cs's yeah. <laughs> yes yeah i all the respect that's cooking for a lot of people and then bringing it up to the flight deck that's a lot uh but it it doesn't even matter we were knocking golf golf balls off of the the end and just awesome. having a good time taking pictures it, it was a lot of fun i think that's my favorite navy day memory that's awesome. Yeah. So, I mean, I want people to realize like, okay, these, these things are horrific that happened to us. Um, they're horrible, but you know, there, there's a lot of good that the military does. And I don't want to ever detract from my military service or make people think like that I'm anti-military or that I didn't have good memories or that I'm not lifelong friends. Like these are my sisters and brothers that I've now known for over 20 years. For me, I have stronger bonds and connections to them than my own family members, right? And so I don't want everyone to think like the Navy is, is this, this horrible place, cause it's not. Um, and I've had a lot of good times in the Navy. Um, a lot of great times, a lot of great times. And uh, I, I got a lot of good bourbon there. I made some moonshine in the, in the Navy. Um, <laughs> I did. <laughs> what, like on the ship, I always wanted to do that. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah. So, did you ever go on an open swim? No, I was so oh. mad. That's my biggest um, regret, even though I can't say I regret it. But they never, we could never do it. Right. Yeah, a lot of people don't understand what that is. So, you know, like um, I drove like uh, landing craft boats or patrol boats. And so like our, our amphibious unit was, a, you know, then attached to a bigger, bigger one. And I was with a squadron. So my Navy experience, like for a carrier was me going to visit friends, right, on a carrier. And I was like, and I was stationed on the, um, the Churchill very, very shortly, a destroyer, right? And I had no desire to be on a carrier. Um, you know, I, I did. I have Navy in my family, right? And so they explained, you know, there's 5,000 people on there. And um, if you want to really know your job or know the people you serve with, either go to a squadron, go to um, a detachment or, you know, go to an amphib unit or go to a small boy and like, you'll either love it or you'll hate it. Right. Because you're going to know those 181 people like back and front, right. There's going to be nothing, but then they were like, you'll find people that are on the carrier at the same time and they don't even know each other. Right. Yep. They, know, mm -hmm. they know their section of people but they, they, they don't really, you know, don't know each other. It's like a huge city. And so I was like, well, I don't really want that experience. So what made you pick a carrier? I didn't get to pick. I was just yeah. so, so whether we just were um, sea duty. So I was just sea duty. And then mm. we're not attached to a certain ship. So they will, we will deploy with a ship who's ever in need. So I actually got to go underway with L and LHD a Ooh. carrier and then Ooh. i went on a hospital ship too so Did i got you go on the mercy ship it was the comfort comfort yes i remember the comfort i loved the comfort when i was uh was stationed in norfolk it was the uh, that was the they've decommed that ship now i believe but it was the uh, really i don't know there's one of them that they took out of service and then they they have only one in operation but maybe explain how amazing that ship is because i don't i don't think people understand exactly because the comfort is kind of like a natural disaster like um for me it's like 
it kind of shows the humanitarian um, part of the Navy um, and really kind of steps in, you know, worldwide. So not just, you know, if we have like, you know, I was there for Hurricane Katrina um, with my, my unit. So like, not just, it's not just the U.S. that the, the comfort help, that kind of helps globally. Um, and I think it's an amazing mission that the that the Navy has that a lot of branches don't. And I think it makes us special and unique. So maybe sharing that would be would be good. Yeah, yeah, it was really cool. And when they were recruiting people who wants to go in the comfort, I was like, I do, I do, because I knew it would be something to yeah. remember. And it's literally like a floating hospital. So mm -hmm. there's not even ladder wells. There's actual staircases. Um, they have really great cooks on board and <laughs> that ship's also haunted there's a morgue what? in the basement and i was working oh nights so i would go down there to try to freak myself out <laughs> and walk around the morgue it was freezing but but yeah we were going to haiti um it was mm -hmm. a there was a hurricane that hit haiti really bad and this was 2016 and we were on our way down there just standing by for relief in case they wanted um, the military's help and they ended up not needing the help but we were ready to take um, people from the hurricane victims on board uh, ready to you know take care of them and eventually hopefully nurse them back to health mm -hmm. yeah I, okay so first of all they needed the help they chose not to um which is foolish on on their their yeah. Foolish on their their um their recovery there. It would have been way easier if they utilized the Navy. Um, so how was it haunted? Because you can't just like bomb drop that. Like you can't just be like <laughs> it was haunted. And so now I gotta know. You know did you see some ghosts? Um, like yeah. you know what's what's going on here? Um, you know what's the story behind, yes. uh, behind the ship hauntings? We we can't just like we can't just like let that one go. I know, and there's so many cool military ghost stories. Um, but this one, it, I was, you know, I was working at nights and I would do weather. So I always have to be at the top so I can go outside a lot and check the weather. And so I was working at night by myself and I went up to, there was a helo pad and then you could go up above where all the radars are. So I was walking up there just to check on the cloud coverage um, and just looking around and there was somebody sitting sitting up there uh by by himself and it was really windy so i was surprised and i was like hey bud like how you doing just ignored me completely i was like all right okay you know i i i'm new on the ship but i i don't think i'm an asshole but whatever <laughs> so i and and nobody goes up there that's why i i thought it was just someone on watch i thought it was a bm and so I go back down and someone comes in the office to do their rounds. And I was like, hey, who's standing watch up there? Um, you know, because I wanted to see who this jerk was. And they were like, nobody stands watch up there. Nobody's even up there right now. And I was like, what? <laughs> and I just had chills. I was like, wow, I wonder who that was and why they came back. Right. As a spirit. Yeah. What uniform were they in? It was so dark. I just, That's I just felt like I saw a headset, and they were yeah. just wearing something dark. That's crazy. Yeah, that's yeah. dope. Yeah, I drove the boats from Normandy. No, no ghost stories for me, darn. Um, but <laughs> you think there would be? Right. I mean, I definitely felt like as soon as I got on that that well deck, I felt like I felt tingling when I got on the well deck um, and basically we sold it to the, the Royal Indian Navy. Like we would get these. So somebody had a great idea that we would go guard the rivers in Iraq with these, with these old ass, you know, historic should be in a museum um, kind of boats. And that we would like somehow not get killed with RPGs. So we kept, you know, as soon as we would get one fixed, they'd be like, okay, we're going to sell them to them. And I'd be like, I'm not fucking fixing another one of these for you to take this away from me, right? Like we're, we're keeping some of these because we're about to go on deployment. And so finally somebody higher up was like, so they're eight knots loaded. We're going to put a platoon of Marines on there. And then we're going to do what? 
we're, we're going to go guard the river so that they can get killed. Um, so thankfully, we didn't have to deploy. Um, <laughs> I mean, you know, like, because we knew, like, even with a patrol boat, with the speed that it goes, right, I was like, well, I can pretend I can outmaneuver an RPG, but we're going to be sitting ducks. <sighs> yeah. With that one, that just felt like a death sentence, right? It just mm -hmm. felt like we're going to die. And um, all of us kind of knew that, but what could you do, right? Other than, okay, we, we got to fix it. You know, we used to be like, we're going to draw straws. Like we literally put, you know, hands in there and be like, we're going to draw straws and um, hey, which one of us do you think we're going to go first, right? <laughs> like, Oh my goodness. Yeah. And there's, is there even a defense system on there? Any defense was weapons? No, no. Um, <laughs> Could mount a mount of you know we were going to mount a weapon on there um and so kind of just like gonna rock it with like a 50 cal we were going to take a platoon and like you know we we're going to have you know two with saws like it was just like the dumbest idea ever because it's like one um first of all iraq was completely mismanaged and fucked up to begin with and this is why we have burn pits and that administration is directly responsible for that um, and so if you haven't filed for the PAC Act, do it anyway. Um, and so basically, you know, they were planting RPGs along the, um, the shoreline, right? And then they were taking that, um, putting that there and then taking IEDs and placing them um, for the Humvees to get blown up. So, you know, somebody came up with, all, like, well, we got to stop, you know, them crossing this this river here and then being able to put the IEDs in all the time. And it was just like, well, the first thing you could do is stop broadcasting the location, mm -hmm. right? They would, they would get on the news and like, listen, I'm from Yonkers, New York, right? So if you put on the news a corner store that I'm familiar with, I'll be like, oh, they're over so-and-so. And so that's exactly what the Iraqi army was doing. They were like literally watching CNN and being like, okay, so here's where the third ID is. And now we're going to send in real time, right? In real time, we're going to have these guys go cross over here and go plant IEDs. And so, I mean, great concept. Uh, again, we did this, the, you know, Blue Water Navy, um, but totally tactically wrong ideas, wrong ideas. Um, so I'm glad it didn't happen because I know I'd be dead, right? Like I, I, we were going to be RPG. We were, we were talking about RPG ducks, right? <laughs> like, oh, that's horrible. Yeah. I mean, that's a, that's some leadership for you. Um, so, I mean, we actually had one of the guys when part of the, the detachment went to, uh, Rhoda, they were just like, the officer seriously came and said, I want you guys to start breaking things. Right. Like, I know that I'm literally putting you in a path of where you're going to die. And so I'm working on it, guys, but we can't be ready yet. You know, like and so when you have someone like in that leadership level saying, like, I see how bad this is, I'm going to stand up and I'm going to put my my military career on the line to make sure that you guys don't die like I mean, it's just, you certainly love that person from, for, for the rest of your life. And that's like where I want people to realize there are good people in the military. There yes. is leadership, but sometimes speaking up is the best thing that you can do. Even when you're fighting against a system, like that's so established in the military, you have to do it, especially when you know that lives are at stake. Like, mm -hmm. um, and so that's where I think true leadership can come at any level. Right. The, the military has trained anybody to pick up that weapon and carry forth leadership ability. And so you don't have to be enlisted or um, an officer to make that happen. You just need to be a person that's disciplined in, in the leadership and understanding the ideas and values of honor and courage and commitment. So, but yeah, that's that's just my little, you know, my little spiel there. Um, you know, so I'm glad it we didn't deploy, like, um, because um, you know, it it would have been a bloody one. Mm -hmm. And so I'm glad that we had good leadership eventually get them to listen. But you know, the the idea came from a person that had real no military strategy or experience whatsoever in a battlefield. 
and he sold somebody on it because he made it look good on paper. Yeah. And, um, you know, that happens a lot. And so, you know, <laughs> when you're, when the brass approves it and now you're having to say, well, you know, so-and-so just because they golf with you doesn't mean they have a good idea and they're just trying to make a name for themselves in the military. You don't do that with people's lives. Like, no. This is a, uh, it's real time. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great point because you can make anything look good on paper. Trust right. me. <laughs> right. And you know what, you know, what doesn't look good on paper, having to have somebody show up to your house with a flag and, and, a, and a notice. Um, that's, that's, that's the, the reality a family could ever get. And so that's, that's the way it was going to happen because you got to imagine there's three of us manning these LCUs and then we're putting 12 Marines or sometimes, you know, um, if it's a smaller boat, we just need four operators. And so, I mean, it, it, it was just like, even, I think I was, I think I was an E5 at that time. And I like, even I saw, right. And even the mm -hmm. E1, we're all like, you want us to do what? Like, who came up with this, right? And then we find it, you know, have you seen Men of Honor? No, I haven't. You haven't seen Men of Honor? Okay, so you have to see Men of Honor, right? It's Cuba Gooding Jr. It's it's the real story about Carl Brashear. And so Brashear, uh, he's the first amputee to come back onto active duty service as a, as a, a diver. Uh, after he, and so there's this pencil pusher guy with glasses and he's an asshole and he's like, this is the new Navy standards. And, uh, you know, I wrote the book on this with no real dive experience. He's just a dick. That's mm -hmm. who this guy was. That's who this guy was like that enemy of the state, like him. Yeah. Right? And so you have to go watch it because there are people like that, you know, when they're like, well, you know, I've done everything I could do. I have no real experience, but I'm book smart. And um, it looks good on paper, but I have no real tactical uh, advantage or knowledge, and I'm just going to get people killed. So, I mean, that's the that's the leadership we got to eradicate. Besides everything else yep. that's going on in the military, that's that's the next one to go. So, mm -hmm. I'm going to post a beautiful picture because I think this is uh, super super great. And, <laughs> And so, um, she, you know, again, she hosts Fed Talks on Sundays at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And you can uh, kind of check her out. And so um, I really highly encourage it. Uh, please go get her book on Amazon. Go to her IG and you'll see it there, Millennium Veterans. So in case you guys need to see that again, it's right <laughs> here. This is on Facebook. Uh, it's a great resource. There's plenty of your, if you're feeling alone, you will never feel alone again there. And, um, you know, you're never alone, period. And so maybe you watch this and you're like, wow, I had no idea that, you know, um, sexual assaults was so prevalent in the military. It is. That's reality. Um, there's discrimination in the military. That's reality. And so we have to do better period as human beings to kind of to kind of fix it and i just want to say thank you for coming on thank you for for using your voice um thank you for sharing um some hard experiences and some good ones and i'm um i'm really proud that you are going forth on this path and helping to empower other veterans i think it's it's so important so thanks for coming on thank you for having me on i i really appreciate it and you know, you're just so much fun to talk to and you, you make me feel so good about myself because we all have those days and I, I really needed this. So I really appreciate you and everything that you're doing for your Amazonian warriors. And yeah, you should, you should feel, you should feel empowered, right? Uh, that is, yes. that is our, our role to, to each other, uh, especially after experiencing such the similar things. Um, I always don't compare trauma, right? But we went through the same shit. And um, I think that, you know, when we're able to say that we're going to label it the way that we want to, it to be heard, right? You don't get to tell my story. I don't get to tell your story, but we can certainly empower each other so that our stories are heard. And I think that's, that's so important, especially in the veteran community. Like, we're not here to compete with each other, right? Like, we're here mm -hmm. to empower each other. We're here to lift each other up. 
And if I have a way that helped me heal, I can just share it, right? But I don't want anyone to be in the darkness where they put a Glock 17 in their mouth and pull the trigger like I did, you know? So yeah. if I can spread a little bit of that happiness around, why wouldn't I? You know, why, why wouldn't we do that for each other? Because we've had so much against us already. Like there's no need for that in this community. Like we need to step forward with each other and be shoulder to shoulder. Otherwise, these guys who who did these things and this culture in the military, it doesn't stop unless we start saying, OK, it's it starts with us. And how can we make this better? So mm -hmm. I thank you for your words and um, I appreciate you. So I'm going to play the closer, guys. And don't forget, you know, uh, Gunslingers Tavern, we're over here. We're slinging drinks slinging questions and uh we're always here for you so reach out if you need help and uh you know i didn't put my overlay today but there you go here's the last moment <laughs> i love it overlay y'all um you know, <laughs> it's all good it's all good and um so again amazonian warrior foundation.org if you need help 802-777-6722 that's that's my direct line for my nonprofit and 988 so even if it's like, I'm not suicidal, but I'm having a shitty day and I just don't feel good, call it, right? And if you don't yeah. want to call that, call me. And if you don't want to do that, reach out to a friend, um, reach out to a battle, uh, reach out to a stranger that's a veteran because chances are they're going to listen. So thank you guys and uh, see you on the next one. That's the show for today, everyone. Thanks for listening. We'll be back next week with an all-new show. And remember, you can listen to us again and again. The podcast of this radio show is available right after we go off the air tonight, anywhere that you can get your podcast episodes. And thanks for joining us today. I'd like to take a moment to talk about something close to my heart. Military Broadcast Radio is doing incredible work to support our veterans and bring their voices to the world. They rely on your generous donations and your dedicated volunteer hours to make it happen. I encourage you to consider supporting NBR in any way, form that you can. Use this QR code that's attached to the picture, or you can go to our website at mbradio.us. That's mikebravoradio.us. To learn more about how you can donate or volunteer even just an hour a week from your home, help make a difference in the lives of our veterans. Because once again, we're all here for you and not for us. We're giving a veterans a voice. Um.